<laughs> Hello, good afternoon. Yay, 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 here we are. Um, thank you all for showing up. <clears throat> it's wonderful to see you. This is the inaugural <laughs> research seminar for 2018, and we want to thank uh, Kate Rosmanis and Joseph for organizing them. And we particularly want to thank our incredibly intrepid and brave and bold and risk-taking, high-flying people who are going to have agreed to talk to us about something today and provide some content. Mm -hmm. um, before we start, uh, I'd like to um, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the estate that Macquarie University is spread upon, where we are today, the Watamatagal clan of the Darug Nation, whose cultures and customs have nurtured and continue to nurture this land since the dream time. We pay our respects. I actually sincerely do pay my respects to elders past, present, and future. And I think that's really important. So uh, thank you, John, for giving me the opportunity to, to say that on behalf of all of us in the Corey University. With that in mind, we are going to pay um, some attention now, a form of respect in, in the form of attention to um, Nicole Matthews, Julianne Long, and Rachel Gunn, and we're going to do it a little informally, starting with hearing from Nicole Matthews about the work that she is currently investigating, thinking about. As you all probably know, Nicole Matthews is a senior lecturer in media and cultural studies here in this department. Nicole works, her work brings together autobiography, deaf and disability studies, popular genres of broadcast and electronic media, and education, which is a really dynamic mix and very interesting. Um, she's done projects in partnership with the Deaf Society of New South Wales and Dementia Training Studies Center, so the work's really having impact and engagement where it matters. And her latest book is uh, published by Routledge, and it's called Digital Storytelling in Health and Social Policy, Listening to Marginalized Voices. So, welcome, Nicole. Thanks so much, Karen. You're going to have to open every event that I ever <laughs> have any involvement with. That's just such a brilliant start. Um, I, I have cheated a little bit for today, so if this seems excessively formal, I've kind of repurposed some slides that I've presented in the past and tried to kind of slice through them with a gendered eye, if you see what I'm saying. <laughs> so I'm sorry if this sounds, it seems a little bit um, formal, but uh, hopefully we will be able to have a, a good wrap around um, the, the topics that I'm going to introduce. And I'll be really keen to get feedback from you about ways in which I might pull gendered analysis through this project a little more because um, it's not, it wasn't one of the founding research questions, I guess, in, in setting up this project. So uh, I'm calling it Hearing Gender, Smartphones and, hits and Hearing Aids, Gear Talk and Bras, and that's a pretty much a rundown on what I'm going to talk about during the course of um, the next 15 minutes or so. Um, so basically this is part of a big research project that I started up last year which is essentially around the problematic of the convergence between mobile phones and hearing amp and amplification devices. So I don't know how many of you are proud owners of a hearing aid, but these days digital, hey, Karen, you know, we're on the same page. Um, so these days the technologies that are used in hearing aids are very much converging with the everyday technologies we're familiar with, with, um, with mobile phones. So uh, my hearing aid uses Bluetooth to talk to my phone. I can stream my phone calls to my hearing aid. I can stream my music to my hearing aid. I can use my phone as a, um, a remote control to manage the settings of my hearing aid. And this is becoming increasingly common. So people with cochlear implants can also do similar kinds of things with their implants. And there's a lot of apps that enable you to use your phone as an amplification device. So chuck your phone at the front of a room, and amplify stuff and have your, you know, groovy Apple cordless earbuds and, um, and hear, from your, hear from your phone. So there's, there's lots of ways in which these two technologies are converging and I find that really interesting. So some of my other projects I've been working on, um, apps that have been set up to um, optimise uh, sound and audio um, from your phone to, to a person who may not identify as hearing impaired or having a hearing loss or being deaf but nonetheless wants to modify the sound that they listen to. So I've got lots of little irons in the fire here and I'm really interested to hear anything else you can suggest to max out the ways in which I start to think about this topic. Um, 
this is why I was really interested in it. I, phones on the one hand, totally every day, but at the same time, I don't know about you guys, I'm totally addicted to mine, I'm lost without it, I feel a bit panicky if I don't know where it is or if it's running out of charge. It's every day but essential. Hearing aids historically have been seen as a kind of stigmatised technology, a special technology. They're fiendishly expensive, even the cheaper one like mine's from Costco. Um, associated with a kind of medical control, you can get hearing aids and also coffins at Costco. Maybe you guys didn't know that, but I recommend it. Check it out. Um, so, yeah, they've, they've in the past been managed by hearing professionals, uh, you know, audiologists, ENT specialists. They've, my dad, who's been wearing hearing aids since he was in his 50s, if he wants to turn up the volume in his hearing aids, he has to make an appointment with his audiologist, go and see them, pay them hundreds of dollars they fiddle with a computer that's linked to his hearing aids. It's kind of mad in the world that we live in now. So this convergence is a really, you know, makes a lot of sense. And, um, and I'm really interested in what does it mean? Does it mean people think differently about hearing aids? Do people frame their identity in different ways around terms like disability, debility, deafness, etc.? How do people make sense of these things? Um, some of the audiologists I've been working with on the project describe themselves as working on a burning platform. Things are changing so fast in that professional field, they're just struggling to keep up. Like there's all sorts of you know, new technologies, new software, um, new professional practices lurking in the wings, buying hearing aids over the internet, um, audiologists being kind of cut out of the picture altogether, use of remote, uh, use of wireless in order to manage hearing aids by professionals who aren't in the same building, all sorts of exciting slash terrifying stuff if you think that your job is gonna disappear. So the professionals are really invested in this convergence. Hearing is a really interesting space because it's a kind of an invisible disability. And so a lot of people who maybe don't hear so well in their 50s or 40s as they did in their 20s really don't talk about it and just manage. Um, it's historically been a, a disability that people don't necessarily identify with uh, other than people in the culturally deaf community who use sign language as a first language. So there's a really interesting set of questions about how you talk to a group of people who don't want to identify themselves as belonging to that group, which I'm fascinated by. And there's also interesting questions around the rhetoric of consumer power and the idea of the individual consumer you know, wresting control from the nasty old doctors and nurses, which is part of the, the sort of popular cyperbole around these kinds of shifts in technology. Isn't it great? Normal people can you know, take the whip hand and control their health and their embodiment uh, and not leave it to some sort of annoying specialist to manage. So if historically disability is seen as a sort of spoiled identity, are these new technologies shifting that? So this was something a lot of people would say, oh, actually, no, there's been changes, there's disability pride, there's deaf pride. Maybe disability isn't a spoiled identity anymore, but this is a um, campaign that happened a couple of years ago in Victoria where Victorian Hearing, trying to sell hearing aids, put out this campaign, hearing aids can be ugly, ours are invisible, and cause a social media fracas, of, as you can imagine. You know, all the parents of um, kids, uh, you know, who used hearing aids say, oh, it's hard enough to get them to wear their hearing aids anyway, you're gonna say it's ugly and, you know. So there was a campaign called um, Hearing Aids of the New Black that was set up using social media to respond to that. And I guess what's interesting about this to me is the fact that it points to the stigma still circulating despite these shifts in technologies. Another aspect of this stuff that really interests me is the fact that um, often sign language using deaf communities have been extremely hostile to kind of biotech, for instance, the um, cochlear implant, although things are shifting in that terrain, but have been tremendous early adopters of technologies like um, mobiles, which can be used very easily to do signed conversations using Uvu or um, FaceTime, those kinds of things. So mobile phones have been really key in culturally deaf communities. So this convergence between specialist technologies, you know, uh, like hearing aids and implants and this everyday technology has presents this sort of interesting shifting ground. Now I didn't set out to talk specifically about gender in this project, but like probably everybody here, um, <coughs> of course you come to every project that you're dealing with with the lens that comes from a, you know, a knowledge of feminist debates over the last you know, several decades. So of course I start thinking about hearing aids and I'm thinking about Anne Gray's work on white uh, and black technologies in the home. You know, the black shiny stereo and the boring old white refrigerator, silver in this instance. But the, the gendering of domestic technologies. Of course I come to it thinking about Cynthia Coburn's work about 
uh, changes in media technologies and labour and the ways in which gender is figured in those kinds of topics. Um, I've put this uh, attractive lass up on screen because she's wearing a cardigan and I was talking to one of the audiologists I was working with who was at a conference uh, for audiologists in some city and she suddenly forgot where the venue was and she was wandering around the lobby of this giant hotel going, where are my people, where are my people? Ah, oh, there they are, there are the cardigans. Okay, so the audiology is an immensely feminised profession. It's not a profession of like dudes in suits. It's a profession of helpful women with slightly sharp haircuts and cardigans. <laughs> and you know, you cannot understand the politics of these technologies without under understanding that gendering. And I'm sure we all felt this as we sat in the town hall a couple of weeks ago, right? You know, listening to the experts from Deloitte who never considered any of these kinds of frameworks. But of course we all do. So mm -hmm. I'm thinking about this in terms of gender because that's what we do in our, in our field. And I'm also thinking about this field in terms of um, autobiographical narratives because it's an area I've been working in for the last, I don't know, decades really. Um, and using autobiographical narratives as ways of addressing these kinds of interesting questions around stigma and identity and so on and the use of technology. So when I found that there were um, consumer expert consumer forums online where people would do reviews of hearing aids, this seemed like a really interesting research resource for me. So I started tapping into what was at the time two um, forums, one called Hearing Aid Tracker and one called Hearing Aid Forum. And I kind of gathered up a whole series of reviews um, and chucked them onto MBivo and I'm still kind of part of the way of through analysing those. But what I wanted to do was use these like, mini re tech reviews as a kind of autobiographical text and look at this corpus of autobiographical text and try and make sense of it. I'm not there yet, I'm still making sense of it and my skills as a social um, scientist are poor, can we say. I'm a humanities scholar by training so I'm still working up to being rigorous. Um, but what I found really fascinating about these tech reviews, I really did think that you could use them as kind of um, abbreviated autobiographical text. So here's a couple of examples from those forums which illustrate that. So here's one, you know, I approached my first hearing aids with a lot of experience. My father and his siblings, one of my brothers, grandparents, cousins, second cousins all wear hearing aids. I knew early in my life I was going to be wearing hearing aids. I'm about the same age as my father was when he received his birth. So we've got family history here. And in the second quote we've got this autobiographical outpouring, one of the very few um, uh, excerpts in this collection of um, narratives which uses the word disability or disabled, virtually never used. The word death, never used. The word disabled, never used. Loss, a little bit more common, but you know, a, a really kind of emotionally touching account of the you know, power of these new technologies in this person's life. So these are quite short but very powerful little texts that I've been looking at. And one of the things I found really fascinating about them is the, narr the narr narrating of the relationship between person and object, because really these are kind of object-oriented autobiographies, you might say. Um, and the most fascinating thing to me were the SIG files. So each of these contributors, particularly the ones who called themselves senior members of these forums, had a SIG file, which is quite common on a lot of forums. If you've been on any forums to do with medical conditions and so on, you'll find people have a little spiel about what in their personal lived experience gives them authority to speak? So, you know, on the forums I used to belong to with my kid who had disabilities years ago, you have dear son, age blah, labelled condition X, you know what I mean, those kinds of things. These people would use SIG, SIG files like this. So, I'm, I don't know about you, but I think they're super weird. Um, Chuck, Navy vet. Oticon Custom ITC Outer Pro with Streamer, Pro 1.3 TV Connect 2, Phone Connect, Streamer Mic and iPhone app. And there's his audiogram, right? Okay, this is what he can hear at different frequencies across the spectrum. Sometimes they divide them by left and right. This is a crazy thing. This is a crazy piece of evidence of the relationship between a person and a technological object. And a really fascinating, to me, fascinating intervention into expertise. So what's going on here is, the, is as uh, you know, Tidenberg and Whelan are talking about here, people using objects to explain themselves, to do that kind of identity work. Clearly what's going on here is an identification with a biomedical and technical definition of identity, right? This is a bio, these, are, these are numbers that are generated in the audiologist clinic um, and they're associated with an acceptance of a biomedical framing of deafness. None of these folks are saying, yeah, I'm an I'm a ASL user and I have been since I was five. They're not talking about that kind of deafness, that sort of cultural deafness. So they're taking on a fairly mainstream conception of, um, 
of, of uh, hearing loss or hearing impairment, note all the deficit uh, terms that get thrown in there. But what I find so fascinating about this is they're reclaiming them as a, source of, as a source of expertise. And they're doing it, in my opinion, through the medium of beer talk, which I would say is a highly masculinised set of discourses. And this is one of the things I find so fascinating about these forums. I won't read you this, but there's heaps of really interesting illustrations of, you know, talk that makes no sense to me may, may make sense to you about frequencies, decibels, compression technologies, different sorts of um, kind of uh, DACs and ADCs, DB of dynamic range. What is this? I have no idea. Some of you probably know what it's about. It's about, it's audiophile talk. So these are people using their audiograms and their audiophile talk. And uh, Peter Doyle put me on some really amazing analysis of the gendered meanings of this kind of audiophile talk. Kia Kiteley in a fantastic article called Turn That Down, She Screamed, um, <laughs> uh, discusses the way audio technology get you, got used in the mid-20th mid century um, and the way in which audiophiles tried to kind of claim back space, domestic space, through the fancy stereo with, you know, separates and stuff. Um, so, you know, Kylie argues that this um, masculinisation was tied to the origins of hi-fi in do-it-yourself hobbyism and connected to World War II military techniques and also was connected to questions of class and you know, cultural capital and prestige. But there's also some fascinating work, historical work, on the use of the, the masculinisation of the use of prosthetics. So particularly veterans, and there's a, such a rich vein of disability studies work around veterans masculinity and disability that this sort of fits into, where man managing the prosthesis is seen as a space for kind of cultural mastery, a kind of um, claim to expertise and a claim to power that's a masculinised claim. So I, I find this stuff around objects really fascinating and culturally resonant, but at the same time I'm a bit sceptical about it. Because I think just as in cultural theory we've all got very interested in objects in recent times, um, so too the audiologists are fascinated by the technologies and use them as a medium of exchange and so too are these expert consumers using objects as a medium of exchange and, and discussion of their identities. And I love Vivian Sobchak's discussion about um, the ways in which kind of cyber talk, cyber nonsense has functioned in, um, in certain forms of cultural theory where the prosthetic or the object comes to have this life of its own, it's animated at the expense of the user and she wants to critique that. So she says, as an effect of the prosthetics amputation and displacement from its mundane context, the animate and volitional human beings who use prosthetic technology disappear into the background and the prosthetic is seen to have a will and life of its own. And I kind of think there's a shadow of this in the way the forums are working. So the technology's front and centre. It means you don't have to talk about certain sorts of stuff. The technology does the work, right? There's a displacement and an evasion that's going on there. And I super love this phrase, so you know, throw this into dinner party conversations whenever you like. The great idea of ontological choreographies. And so in, in the stead of this foregrounding of the object in and of itself, I want to draw on um, Rachel Prentice's um, kind of adoption of this phrase, ontological choreographies, from Charis Thompson's work on fertility clinics. So Thompson says an ontological choreography is the deftly balanced coming together of things that are generally considered parts of different ontological orders, so part of nature, part of yourself, part of society. And Prentice illustrates this. So when people come into in vitro fertilisation clinics, they'll often say, oh, my ovaries are not cooperating. But if they get pregnant, they say, oh, I'm pregnant. Okay, so they become the subject rather than the object in the conversation. And similarly, Sobchak, when she talks about pro her prosthetic as a person who is a survivor of uh, cancer and had a, a leg amputated, she said, uh, there will be the prosthetic um, that's abstractly viewed. And then it becomes my prosthetic, leaning against the wall. And then it becomes just my leg, which works alongside my other leg when I'm using it and walking along. So there's this range of different relationships between objects and people um, in, in between object and subject. And I think this idea of objects and people functioning together in this sort of ontological choreography in particular spaces is coming to be a more normative way of thinking about this technology in, in audiology as well as more broadly. So a located and place-based understandings of these technologies. And also an understanding of these technologies as functioning in relationship in, as is starting to become a more standard way of um, talking about the technologies. I can't show you this, 
but I would strongly recommend checking out Cochlear um, have this video called Hearing Test in Disguise, which is like a little mini film, and it's meant to be a hearing test. Um, it's really well made, it's quite gripping and quite interesting, but also, in my opinion, I'd love to talk about this, incredibly emotionally exploitative, in my <laughs> view. So basically, there's this relationship of this couple, straight couple, got together in the 80s, listening to mixtapes and stuff, and then they aged together. And slowly but surely, their conversation gets concealed by background noise. And so, you, at the end, you're asked, does love last? Okay, and if your hearing's a little bit dodgy, like <laughs> mine is, no, it didn't last. You know, it all went to hell, the relationship fell apart. But if your hearing's good, then love lasts. So what does this tell you? This technology will you know, keep those long-term relationships good to go. Um, but on the flip side, if you don't have those hearing technologies, geez, life's gonna be loveless. It's gonna be grim, right? Very dodgy, but at the same time, moving beyond biomedical accounts of hearing, moving into social accounts of hearing. So I think this is a really interesting set of moves. What fascinates me about the stories people tell about their hearing and their hearing technologies is that they are really deeply implicated with relationships and gendered relationships. So, for instance, the thematic of I don't have hearing loss but my wife says I do is absolutely everywhere in these forums. People are constantly talking about that. And when I was starting to, uh, to think about presenting this stuff on Gear Talk, I was like, oh, you know, you're such a... You're such a feminist and you always think about these things in gendered terms. What's, you know, think like the devil's advocate. Are these people really men? It seems like most of the posters are male, but you know, we don't really know. Okay, so I did a text search on my corpus on the words husband and wife, and there were 26 wives and one husband. So I think that what that tells you is, and you know, maybe there's lots of, um, non-straight couples out there in um, hearing aid review land, but I don't actually think so at this point. So it is, I think there is some evidence that relationships are how people define hearing. So hearing is defined as, I can't hear my wife's voice. And I had a great guy I did an interview with a while ago who said, he actually took his wife down to the audiology clinic and said, this is the voice I need to hear. Get these to work for right. her, right? In a good way, you know, not as a ball and chain. But really, really fascinating. <laughs> so social spaces are mapped as gendered spaces and familial spaces and wanted to hear grandchildren's voices um, as well as um, wives' voices is really important. So I think actually at the end of this project, I've basically come to the conclusion I was asking the wrong questions at the beginning. So the questions I was asked were, will this convergence of technology end the stigmatisation of hearing aids and make people think about these technologies differently? But I've come to that, you know, why are people not wearing hearing aids? What are the barriers? Why? How can we make them wear hearing aids? And these are the questions audiologists are interested in as well. But looking at these kind of forums and listening to the interviews that I've done with people who use hearing aids, I've, I've started to think about these questions in different ways. So here's a great quote from one of the guys I interviewed over at the National Acoustic Laboratories. Um, he said, hearing aids make me tired. I've just said to people, look, my car runs better when I'm not wearing my hearing aids. <laughs> I can say I'm glad I'm deaf. There's a lot of things I miss and I'm glad I miss them, you know. So this is one of the very few people who describe themselves as deaf, himself as deaf, but he's talking about the object of the hearing aid in particular locations, and they're not gender-free locations. The car, hearing the weird sounds the car makes. You know, these are gendered spaces. So if the, the question becomes when and why do people wear hearing aids, you start to start thinking about things in terms of social uh, locations, uh, you start thinking about them in terms of relationships, not in terms of necessarily of identities. And you start thinking about them in terms of these ontological choreographies. A final example of this, which I think is also a gendered example, but feel free to draw it out further <laughs> if you can pick up more in it. Public Facebook book group, which I belong to, called Auslan Matters, so Australian Sign Language Matters. Many of the postings are really brief. People don't, there's not much of a discussion around them. Someone posts this up. I was at my audiologist yesterday and I was telling her about my taking my hearing aid out in the evening. And she asked, why do you do that? And I said, it's my deaf time. All she said was, make sure you wear your hearing aid as much as you can, which I said is from six in the morning to maybe eight at night. She didn't get deaf time. She doesn't understand how you need a break after all the concentration that's needed to hear. Okay, so this produced a frenzy of responses from the people on the group. So some hearing, some non-hearing, non some deaf, and some hearing people. And the, these qu quotes, I think, are the, some of the most telling. So, you know, someone's saying, get home, first thing I do, take the hearing aid off, then get my runners off, air out my feet, air out my ears. Uh, my favourite, 
I like to take my hearing aid off when I'm at home in the evening. Same with my bra. Know what I mean? That <laughs> produced a lot of responses. Yeah, yeah, I don't want to hear that. Um, and then, uh, you know, more obviously political comment. I still have audiologists in Australian hearing telling me how I can benefit from them and how to wear them, pro wear them properly after 50 years of wearing hearing aids. I think I'm in a better position to tell them. <laughs> So I guess what I wanted to draw out of this is maybe the gendered associations of safe domestic spaces as a place where social light might shift onto different terms. Some of these guys talked about, well, if I take my hearing aid off at home, my family have to recognise I'm bilingual and I'm using a different language when I'm home, I'm using sign language, or this is a different space for me. I think it's really interesting to reflect on the ways in which the, the requirement to be social is associated with wearing hearing aids, you know what I mean? So if you don't wear a hearing aid, it's damn hard to be social if you, you know, if you are hard of hearing. Um, and often people will talk about the ways that elderly relatives, particularly male relatives, will withdraw from social life because hearing is just too hard and they just don't want to do it anymore. And I'm interested to think through the ways in which sociality, this quote suggests, sociality might be an obligation for women and might be something that's the opportunity to withdraw from that sociality might be me, mean something very different in, mas in a masculine body. I think that's a really interesting set of questions. Mm -hmm. There are many other questions we could ask by slicing and dicing this stuff around gender, but I hope that's got a few yeah. directions yeah. to take. Anyway, so I'm sorry that was a slightly uh, a, a presentation from a different occasion, but I'd be really interested in any thoughts you have about mm -hmm. ways of taking it around gender. Yeah.